Hey guitar champion, what's going on? Justin Hombach here, back from my practice cave and welcome to today's interview together with Rafael Trujillo. No, he's not the son of the bass player from Metallica, but he is one of the most incredible guitar players from the next generation of guitar players. You may know him from his work with technical death metal legends Obscura and maybe from his new band Obsidious. He is one of the most controlled player out there. So I wanted to sit down with him with this new kind of series here and want to talk with him about guitar practicing, a practice routine, guitar education and everything that is important for us to maybe hopefully in the future get on the same level like Raphael do. So let's start with the intro and let's check out today's interview. Cheers! So welcome Raphael to today's video. Glad to have you here on my YouTube channel. Hello. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Yes. Today we want to talk about again, practicing guitar education, guitar education in YouTube world and the YouTube community. And I want to start this series where you are kind of the first guest of with a question and that is have you practiced today? And if yes, what is actually uh, what is currently on your practice schedule? Well, um, actually, I I did practice today, but very just but just a few um, yeah, not for too long, just a few minutes uh, because I'm actually working on some songs right now, and I just improvised over a chord progression. That's that's all. I did for today, but um, I have some plans. Uh, so the thing is, right now I'm trying to make it between one or two hours every day, and very structured. So with a timer, um, like in twenty-five minute sessions or thirty minutes, it it depends. But um, these are like my uh, or this is my usual method, how I organize my practice uh, routine. And um, yeah, it depends what's coming up. Um, for example, when I practice something for uh, playing a show or so, for example, with Obsidious or, or with Panzer Ballet, now uh, I have some shows to play um, in in a few weeks. So I integrate that into my practice schedule. And what I do is basically I write it down just on a piece of paper, like the four different topics, because four different topics would be two hours mm -hmm. if each topic is 30 minutes. Yeah. That's pretty much how I handle that. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much the same like uh, I do. I also like to do 25 minutes because then you can do a five minute break till the right. next session starts. And I have a whiteboard right here where I always write down in the early morning like what I'm going to do today. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. We're going to talk a little bit about the schedule later on. But before that, um, what I love about your playing in particular is especially the the control that you have over your instrument in not only the bedroom situation but also in the life situation. I love to watch old um, obscura shows. There are some full shows on YouTube that you can watch, and it's really inspiring to see how in control you are with your instrument, even in these kind of technical music on these kind of life situations. What would you say are the key elements for you that gave you this control that all of your playing is based or is not based on luck, but you already always knew what you are doing? What would you say are the key elements for that? Well, I think, or at least in my case, um, I learned a lot from classical musicians because I grew up uh, playing classical piano. I, I went to a school where they taught like uh, a lot of classical stuff. I even played competitions back then as a mm. very young teenager um, for pianos. And I had very, very good teachers uh, in that 
in that scene at least and um they have some methods which really helped me in order to execute these things live because that's pretty i see like for example obscura stuff or obsidian stuff or any technical music um in metal it's i compare it to classical music because it's it's all written out there's no um there's not really a lot of space for improvisation or anything all the riffs are written out the solos are written out um there might be some some places where you can like where you have space to mm -hmm. improvise for example if you make a longer solo section or or anything like that but it's really but everything is really prepared um also with the click track with the preset changes um it's all written out and it's it, it it's always in the same tempo that's also something which helps because of the click track because sometimes um i also already had like the um, experience that you play something live um or you practice for it at home and then you play it live and then the drummer counts it in like much faster mm. <laughs> and and um the, this doesn't really help um yeah. so um in our case we always try to make it as yeah as easy as possible um or as let's say as um so that it sounds familiar to our ears like the tempo should always be the same mm -hmm. so one thing is definitely to like to play to a click track um so there is no um yeah surprises so mm -hmm. to say in the live situation mm -hmm. and also one other thing um is obviously um i have the guitar strap pretty high actually compared to a lot of other players because i wanted to have it on the same um yeah. like on the same level as as when i'm sitting yeah and that's the only um yeah that's that was the only way for me to um yeah to execute this kind of music live because i've had shows where i played a different strap because i also um a turned um like i tried out different things as well um different gear different straps longer mm -hmm. shorter yeah. um and yeah uh i couldn't do what i wanted to do mm. live so after a while i found out the perfect um length of the strap in yeah. order to yeah play these totally totally things so, yeah something where i totally say that it's important life um and also to know your body life because I mean, some people, they have longer arms, the distance from their arm to their torso and their legs is a little bit shorter than for other people. For me, for example, I don't have too long arms. I need the guitar. I ride higher up here so I can have my arm more like when I'm playing uh, sitting down. But yeah. on the other hand, take a look at Kiko Loreo, for example, who plays really down yeah, his guitar. That's true. But he has long arms. Or Paul Gilbert, all these kind of guys, they have really long arms. For them, that is not that much difficult, like for somebody who has short arms. So I think nobody should be ashamed for having the guitar right up here. <laughs> uh, because for me, for me personally, I think it looks cool. A lot of people are then like, nah, 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 this is not rock and roll, whatever, blah, blah, right. blah. But I mean, when it helps to. Um, to bring that music especially that music to the people then it's totally i'd say it's totally cool to have the guitar up here what i'm experimenting currently live is something which is called the drop strap which is like a button that you can press and then the guitar goes down and when you press it again the guitar goes up again so <laughs> when i play with with mega life and some rhythm sections coming on then i have the guitar down here and then i can zoop, put it up again here to play all the solo stuff oh wow uh, I, I can't play any solo stuff when the guitar is down low here because my arm is just, I can't do any speed picking when the arm is like this. 
because yeah. then you can activate all the muscles that you need for a um, good control speed picking. It's not possible. No. Right. It's a total different like movement. Also in yeah. the left hand, like yeah. if if you have it like there, like the the angle changes yeah. completely. Yeah. And I think this is totally, totally uh, important to see. What I would love to experiment as well as something that um, Rusty Cooley has is that his knob where he puts the, the strap knob is um, um, screwed on the backside of the guitar, not on top of the horn, but on the back ah, of the horn. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. a little bit more on the left side of the body, like when you have it on classical position. Because this is actually something that sometimes annoys me that when I play classical and then standing up the guitar is a little bit more like in this angle here on the right side because of how the straps works and then i have to fix something again yeah uh, yeah but i mean That's it's true. all better than having the guitar right down here <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can't play like that i i tried but uh, it's <laughs> not possible <laughs> i mean you can you still can look cool when the guitar is up here as long as you move a little bit and uh, make yeah a bit of performance yeah yeah you still can look cool so you've just mentioned that you see uh, technical metal music, you're comparing it to classical music, a little bit too different to, um, to jazz and fusion, or for example, the work that you have to play with Panzer Ballet. Um, so is the way how you practice, for example, a Panzer Ballet uh, set different than for an Obsidious set, or is it in the end kind of the same approach? Well, um, obviously, it's it's a little bit different because when I practice for like back then, when I practiced for Obscura, for example, mm -hmm. it was mainly technical stuff. I yeah. practiced it was mainly sitting there with the metronome, checking out the uh, like the licks or, or the, the parts. Mm -hmm individually and then bringing it up to speed um and then also a huge learning for me was um playing this kind of music like every day on stage that helped me a lot because you're forced to play it in full speed yeah there's no way you can like um you can like say oh Sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah, let's do thing. it again. Please, let's do it again, or or let's make it ten percent slower yeah. or so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it forces you to play that, and obviously there is so much, so so many times where you fuck up, and then you. Uh, but then that's good for your progress. Actually, yeah. it's good to fuck up because uh, then you know what to work on. Yeah, um, and and that's also something. I really um, did a lot, or I do a lot, um, like, uh, I, I want to go back to a question, when I compare it um, to other music, um, technical music is always something where I focus on the hard parts of the set. Also, warming up, warming up for me is, uh, I warm up with, like, hard the hardest parts of the set like slow checking out the movement mm. making some bursts and mm -hmm. all of that and when i practice for um for other type of stuff it's more of playing through the whole song um like as clean as possible again that's that's kind of the same thing because like the the theme is written out, but when it came when it comes to soloing and to improvising, because that's that's where the real difference is. Um, I focus like more on getting licks ready to like prepare them to play them at the show, checking out every little chord change, playing over it. So it's a lot of improvisational concepts i use there to practice that stuff mm. um and also sometimes it's a lot of reading so mm. for example with pansable i don't <laughs> i'm sorry my phone um for example when i when i practice for pansable it's a lot uh, of reading as well because i get sheet music and i have to read 
actual notes mm. um not only tabs but actual notes the, because the I nightmare. Need to, yeah yeah <laughs> i need to understand like the relation mm. um from the notes uh to the chords and everything so you see this thing as a bigger picture because then also when you improvise over it you want to really know okay how did the theme go uh mm. maybe i want to integrate that into yeah. my solo somehow so it's a totally different world of yeah mm. practicing mm -hmm. but i think often that in the core in practicing for improvisation and practicing in, for in the technical kind of skill and from the core mindset here it sometimes it, it has a lot of um relation to each other because often people have this kind of romantic uh, vision of improvising like it's something that happened out of nowhere and that you can all of a sudden can play all these licks uh, without preparing right. them um like they want to improve the improvisation by just turning on the backing track and playing over the backing track but i often think that is this is not the best way to work on improvisation how would you describe would be a good start or a good way to work on certain improvisation or what would you say is the main uh, philosophy behind working on improvisation like for me it's building up vocabulary mm. um it's it's yeah. pretty much that like playing of course playing licks learning licks but integrating them into your playing and being able to execute them in any key in any yeah. scale adapted to other uh, songs other like other patterns like playing the same notes but with different techniques or so mm -hmm. um this is really something to like to mm. get started because as you said like just like obviously you can just uh, put on the backing track and then play play along with it and that's good but if you really want to make progress it's 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 good if you work on your vocabulary mm. transcribe music listen to other people uh, how they uh, improvise and and check out your own licks write them down play them in in different keys in in all of that because mm. um different subdivisions all this yeah different stuff. subdivisions and all that yeah. stuff that's that really like this is how you um yeah how you get some progress in mm. that yeah at which at which point would you say do you have the confidence to say okay this lick now it works for me i don't have to practice this lick anymore it's checked i can play it uh, or do you miss when do you still know okay i need to work a little bit here on that movement on this movement because one big problem that i had in the past or one big mistake that i made in the past is that i quick i jumped too quickly from one lick to the next lick practicing a lick for a few days and then jumping to the next lick without really knowing okay i'm now able to play that lick in these life situations so when is this when does this point comes to you where you know okay this lick i can play it yeah that's a hard that's a hard thing like to to get because you never know there's always something you can work on Mm. um for me i have the experience that it works best if i just make my practice plan for one or two weeks mm. be consistent with that and then change it up after yeah one or two weeks i change it up and i just move on to the next one mm, that's a good point uh, uh. after some because time. I, I realized while transcribing certain musicians that of even the big improvisational gods from bebop and jazz, you can break them down to just a few licks sometimes, but right. they are so uh, they can they can play with these licks so easily that you won't recognize that it's that lick again because in a, it's in a different spot of the of the song or from the uh, improvisation or on a different bar. This is something that I've realized. So, we just sell, say for yourself that sometimes you have certain trademark licks that you kind of always play when you have a night full of improvisation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think 
for yourself, I mean, at least I, I can only speak for myself, but um, I always, I always have the feeling that I play the same thing over and over again. Mm. And I think as a listener's perspective, perspective, it's a little bit different, but from myself, because I know myself uh, really well when I play, I know uh, which licks uh, are working and which are not. Um, so um, I come down to play the same thing over and over again. And if you really study like other, like if you go more into the fusion direction, like Mike Stern, Greg Howe, mm -hmm. or um, or whatever, all those players, Guthrie Govan, um, they use similar shapes. They use uh, also Frank Gambali. He's, yeah. he's playing, like he has a few uh, licks he's playing like all the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, you never, and you never will, at, at an improvisation, you will never play something you never played before. Yeah. So that uh, the key is always to check out new things, slowly getting familiar with the mm. new vocabulary and then integrate it. Yeah. Um, it's like a language. Yeah. I mean, the art behind it is sometimes as well that the listener won't get bored uh, of these licks, even that you are using them quite often in the night. I mean, when I remember, I've seen uh, Frank and Bailey a few months ago. And of course, I know this famous, I don't know, four licks and fourth that he's always sweeping yeah. and the pentatonic licks that he's sweeping, all this kind of stuff. But it was never a point in this live set where it starts to get boring because everything else around it, how he build up a certain solo, how he creates dynamic, how he creates tension, all this kind of stuff was was more in the focus and it was more important than a solo. And by that, it never got boring. So. This yeah. is something that I always try to take a look on. You probably do is to, to when you improvise a solo or work on your solo, that you also work on tension, on the build up, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah that keeps it fresh. Mm -hmm. um, that the, all these other things keep it fresh, and also uh, practicing all those licks and and all these, uh, yeah, your vocabulary in different. In different tempos as well like all the songs have different tempos have different um yeah moods or vibes mm. so to yeah. say yeah and um yeah it also depends on the other musicians what they play it, it depends on a lot of different factors yeah um but yeah improvisation in the end is just uh, the art of combining um everything you practiced before basically yes. and, yeah. I, I always say it's like a, a mirror reflection of your subconsciousness playing what you can right. play from a subconscious that you can you can play this in an improvisation as well and when you can't play it subconsciously then it's hard to get it smooth into an improvisation or good yeah yeah. Improvisation. yeah that's true that's interesting now you mentioned that you are structuring your practice routine in this kind of two weekly cycle um what kind of topics determine what you want to practice? Is it more like, okay, I have to do this for social media or this for bands? Or do you sometimes even say to yourself, oh, here I could work on certain basic stuff, something that I do a lot nowadays, like, ah, kid, I could work on inside picking again or on this kind of sweeping movement, or is it more all lick, lick based that you can later on use in a musical way as well? Most of the stuff is um well uh, from the beginning um like if it comes down to to the to the topics itself um i'm practicing of course as i said i'm working on like stuff i play live and, mm. and uh, which i have to do or so but when i do clips for social media um that uh, doesn't have to do anything with my practice schedule because when I practice, I really want to focus on my practice and, and I don't want to think of anything else. Um, so I, I work on only that mm -hmm. and all the social media work I do. Um, I mean, I guess it's, it's not that much uh, as you do, but 
um but some of the stuff is actually uh, i do later in the during the day mm. and i practice for that when uh, before shooting the video but it's not part of my regular practice schedule so in theory i play a lot more guitar during the day i also songwrite with the guitar and all that stuff but real practice and focusing on on stuff I want to like be better at mm -hmm. it's um, I do this in in my regular practice schedule and <clears throat> and it's it's regularly I I do a lot of like licks as I just um, said it's it's a lot of improvisational stuff I work on um, not that much technical stuff because I know that as soon as I get back to play with Obsidious or so, um, that these are like parts of my, or these are like times where I only focus on technique mm. and playing that stuff. So mm. all the time in between I have, I try to focus more on like getting new vocabulary uh, down, playing, like uh, yeah, working on uh, on on methods from um, I don't know Tim Miller or mm. stuff like that. That that's a good uh, good bridge to the next topic because do you have certain inspiration or certain guitar players that always inspire you for something new in your practice routine? Like when you see a certain reel from a certain guitar player that you think, ah, oh, okay, I should check out this lick or what is he doing there? Are there any guitar players out there that truly inspire you or is it more coming from your own, that you're looking at your own playing and that you don't know, <laughs> okay, ah, I could play this lick again for me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not from me. Uh, I definitely can speak of that uh, I really um, enjoy watching other people's uh, playing um just to name i mean there are so many yes. amazing players out there it's it's incredible yeah. but um yeah i mean just to mention a few names obviously i always um check out stuff from from tim miller i also had like um private lessons with him a while ago mm -hmm. um and I check out like, um, for example, Czech God, you know, is, is, is an amazing player. I, I love watching his videos and, mm -hmm. and watch him play. Um, I even, um, yeah, check out his, like some of his licks or mm -hmm. so and, and try to like adapt that. Uh, but for me in my way, um, to not copy him, obviously, um, but he's like amazing or also like other people like Stefan Taranto who yes. is where I just like watch him play and, yeah, yeah. and I get inspired from that. Yeah. And I also, um, in a way that I'm like, oh, that's, that is, it's really, it's really impressive even to me, like what, yeah. yes. um, how technical. Yeah. it can be sometimes um, and that's very inspiring that is truly really inspiring and i think it's also really inspiring to see that coming from people that are younger than you i mean we are all kind of the same age stephen toronto you me i'm i think i'm a little bit older than you guys but only a few years but then seeing guitar players like Bexty, for example who was like in yeah. his early 20s people like these guys you know and um this kind of inspire me Maybe some people get frustrated by it, seeing that ah, oh, these young people they can play so much better than me, and these guys they can play better than me. But on the other hand, it's inspiring because I see that certain educational concepts seems to work because these guys could um, develop such a good technique with such a young age. So there must be something, there must be a certain truth behind certain educational concepts. Uh, and so I check them out for myself as well. And I love to, to see and to hear how these guys are practicing and all this kind of stuff. So I can adapt that into my practice routine as well. And something that I 
learn from these guys is and from you or watching your videos is how important it is to have an awareness about what you are doing that you always know which kind of movement do we have in a certain legs and all this kind of stuff yeah. what helped for me a lot and i often talk about this in this channel here is filming myself do you do something for you that you record yourself or film yourself while guitar playing not on other private stuff hopefully but uh, <laughs> that you you have something where you can analyze your playing really deeply is it something that is helpful for you yeah definitely i mean it it really helps like to record yourself and to film yourself and then just watch it and um actually there is one thing about uh like when i transcribe something mm -hmm. uh, when i transcribe like a whole set solo section or or something like that um my goal was always to be able to pre to play that in one take for um for for a video or or something like that 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 was my goal before i move on to the next solo that's that's with whole solo sections um but it it totally helps because you get instant feedback um i can see my di tracks right mm -hmm. here when i mm -hmm. when i yeah play along and then i see okay this was way too early uh, mm. uh, and then this uh, note was uh, too late or or whatever um it it's really you can see every little detail and that helps a lot to see um yeah where where are my weaknesses yeah. and what do i have to work on yeah because we sometimes don't realize it while practicing because our perception is so limited while practicing right. sometimes my my thoughts are somewhere else but not at practicing and sometimes like in a meditation i have to bring back my thoughts like okay focus on that lick that you're practicing because sometimes it happens that i practice a lick and then start to think about okay what i'm going to eat today or <laughs> about certain topics that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting true. for me yeah yeah so you're somebody who's teaching a lot as well like with online private lessons and all this kind of stuff yeah um and i i bet you have students that are also from the younger generation because i think from what i've seen a lot of younger guitar players are looking up at you and um what would you say from your experience is may are maybe some uh, difficulties that the next generation has to face when it comes to learning guitar and education because of the new social media impact that they have are there any difficulties or how would your experience describe this um actually for this topic i have two things uh, mm -hmm. which uh, come into my mind immediately the first thing is like to focus on one thing for a longer period of time and be patient mm -hmm. um that's something which i think is difficult nowadays because every day you can watch a new video a new guitar channel uh is uh, or, or uh, every guitar channel is like putting out uh videos like constantly and you get like new ideas like every day mm. and um i think it's good to all i mean all this information is amazing and it's really cool but also you should like um focus on one thing mm. for a certain amount of time in order to progress because um yeah if you if you jump from one thing to another it's it's it doesn't go really yeah. um yeah there's no uh, there's no way there's no shortcut yeah. for being playing better and the the second thing um i think there is one thing actually i've seen like there's this rick beato video where like um with uh john petrucci abasi mm, yeah, and, and tim uh, hansen and and abasi yeah no, I think it was Devin. Um, ah, no, Devin. Townsend. Yeah, Tim Henson was another video. Yeah, yeah. With yeah, Devin yeah. Townsend I think it was that video, and yeah. they mm -hmm. talked about the topic 
um, as well. And I um, I thought this is really interesting uh, because I'm I'm seeing kind of the same thing. Like people are not really playing by ear anymore, or mm. not, at least not learning because there is tabs for everything, mm. um, and there is a video for everything so if you want to learn a song you just have to look it up on youtube and there is some guy like showing it even though a lot of stuff is is wrong too but that's another (laughs) that's another topic um but it's like there's like a tutorial and there's like tabs in it and um and it's all ready to like just sit down and and play that and imitate that but um there's not this whole progress where um where you sit down listen to it just yeah. listening without seeing anything or, or even close your eyes listening to to the music um how how it sounds and then also um thinking of okay how is he doing that and then finding a fingering that makes sense for you and listen to every single note, like slow it down and listening to every single note. Ah, did I get that right? I have to repeat it again. And obviously it's a long process, but that process, in my opinion, it's very important yeah. to uh, get a good, um, I mean, to, yeah, get, get flexible and, and be a good um, musician in general, because it trains your ears. This is yeah. so much, so, so important. And I think, we uh we really forget that sometimes when we and I scroll think through it. it it also makes a lot of fun it is always like a little riddle that you have to solve i always right. have to yeah, face yeah. it when i have to prepare my set list for for megadeth there are certain situations where on the internet there are just wrong tabs when it comes to chris poland solos or right. even some marty friedman solos and especially marty friedman i always love this journey of sitting down listening to hangar 18 and trying to get all the nuances all the phrasing kind of bits and pieces yes. and trying to get them so much under my fingers so i can reproduce them in a live situation right. um, and this this is a lot of fun i always loved this kind of journey and as well then trying to copying it as close as possible it's always something that brought my playing to the next level some people might think now okay then you're only copying something but i believe more in you are starting to really learn a language and to adapt that language uh, one really important step for me to learn swing feeling was to yeah. um, transcribe a solo by Grant Green, which is more kind of yeah. unfamiliar jazz guitar player. But I really like this kind of style because he's not too flashy. He's really having some really cool phrases, but not too fast. So especially really good for beginners as well. And they're really trying to nail that uh, that solo trying to copying it my my teacher back in the day he was a saxophone player he told me like try to play the solo up to a point where you can't um can't um hear if it's a recording or if it's your solo because then you really get the timing right and it helped me so much for my timing and my dynamic and that i'm not the next grand green clone because it's only (laughs) one solo and this is something that i always recommend then to try to to especially for beginners to go from one guitar player to the next guitar player and by that creating some sort of melting pot and creating your own version of guitar playing after that i think it starts to get a copy when you're just doing john petrucci (laughs) or other guitar players (laughs) but uh, yeah trying to mix it up a little bit yeah yeah but that's truly really important and it comes back to your first thing as well the focus kind of thing I have some sort of cocky opinion about something. And when people are asking me, oh, can you play, can you even play that lake? Or can you play that solo and whatnot? My answer is always yes, because actually people like on our level or even people on that are more on the beginner kind of field, we can, we can play everything. It only costs one thing, time. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it takes a little bit more time to learn something and sometimes a little bit less. Learning a John Petrucci solo for me is a little bit easier because I know that vocabulary than other guitar players and can only cost me like an afternoon. But one thing that shortens this value of time is focus. 
And the more fo you focus on something, the less time you need to learn a certain. Yeah, that's true. I believe we all players like on our level, um, when when we when when we want to be good as I don't know country guitar or as classical guitar, when we would stop playing shredding and fusion immediately and only focusing for two years on classical guitar, I would say all of us we will be pretty good at guitar uh, classical guitar uh, because it. We, we took this focus and the time for it. And um, this is something where I talked about with uh, Josche Stefan, for example. We mm -hmm. I have a German podcast uh, where you were a guest as well twice for the German viewers now. And um, there we had Josche Stefan and we asked him like, hey, how did you become this gypsy jazz god? And he said like, he, he was only playing gypsy jazz. He was only focusing about it, listening to the records all over again and transcribing all of this and getting the licks done. This is maybe something that is missing nowadays, as I've mentioned, uh, because the guys back in the 90s or the 80s, they only had that, but by that they also was forced to have this kind of focus on one particular thing. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah. It all comes down to like having the knowledge of um yeah, of how to practice. Because mm -hmm. actually I think that anybody can could like possibly play stuff i play it's not yeah, yeah. it's not like uh, it's really just it really comes down to just to know how to practice it um but in the end uh, it's uh, it's that's what makes um yeah wh what how do you say it it makes me different from a beginner's player is only the time I put in yeah. and the knowledge yeah. I have about how um, I do it. And I guess, um, or I think actually it's our, um, or at least it's also for me, um, part of my passion, like to share this knowledge mm -hmm. so people uh, don't have to go through like yeah. that much yeah. um errors yeah. as, as i uh, experienced and um that's uh that's also why younger players now can can get better uh, much sooner also it's because all this knowledge is out there mm -hmm. and and that's actually that's great i think it's important to find a way how to filter this information because yeah. it's way too much information and of course information can be different this one guitar teacher says something like that i maybe say something different the other guy says say something different as well and i think it's it's important to filter and to get this awareness about okay which kind of information all of them may have the same value but which kind of information is the best for me now did you mm -hmm. have these kind of similar situations in your time learning it or was there in a determined path that you've go like okay when you start learning guitar and then studying do you always had a certain path um, from what you want to practice or did you had to be on this journey by yourself as well that you have to figure out what to practice next for your or what is best for your next progress yeah yeah as a, for for me it was uh, it was always like i always liked to have a teacher so i mm -hmm. i had different teachers who told me hey you should practice that you should play that you should learn that um so i'm far away from self-taught because mm -hmm. i know that a lot of players are also self-taught um but uh, yeah. which is okay which is fine but it sometimes annoys me when people are trying to get themselves or making themselves better than other guitar players because they are self-taught when it's more like right. oh yeah i'm self-taught there's like this cockiness behind that this is something that <laughs> often kind of annoys me because it's not bad to have teachers it is i don't know why no. people sometimes think that it's not cool to have a teacher that's cool to be self-taught it doesn't matter in the end you know <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, for me, it doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. Um, it's everybody can like, uh, it's just important to know what works for yourself. Mm -hmm. And 
for me, I always had teachers and I really liked that. That's, mm -hmm. um, that's something I, um, yeah, what kept me like motivated and, and, uh, like staying on track with everything. And, um, there's no like specific, like, let's say, um, specific path I followed or anything. It was more um individual depending on what projects were coming up for example um it it would be totally different i would play totally different if i never would like have joined obscura or, mm. or um have had like would play stuff like that because back then actually i was i was uh, studying jazz guitar at the conservatory in amsterdam and I would probably be much more jazz oriented now um, if I wouldn't have this, um, all the bands I played in. Um, How old was you back in the day when you joined Obscura? Uh, I was 20. 20. Around 20. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was, uh, um, uh, I was studying there at the, um, at the conservatory, or I think it was 20. Yeah, 21. Mm -hmm. I turned 21 and mm -hmm. during that year. Mm -hmm. um, Still pretty young to become a guitar player of a touring band that is playing such a hard music, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a big challenge. But yeah. um, I took this challenge and it that challenge really helped me to play, uh, like to be the guitarist I am today. Mm -hmm. And I'm really thankful for that. And I really can recommend this to anybody like to play with other musicians, play, mm -hmm. um, play shows because that's where you really get like a huge, uh, progress. Mm -hmm. And if you look, because we're switching all, uh, like all the time from like metal music to jazz music, but, um, that's pretty much what I do my entire life. Um, <laughs> if, if we look to, uh, into like, uh, Chikoria electric band or stuff like that, mm. they are amazing players, but also because they play this kind of music, like so much, like they, they, and they perform this music, mm. like, um, a thousand times. Yeah on stages all over the world and this is like what makes them so yeah. good and also if you watch other bands like metal bands playing live the ones uh like usually um if you hear a really good band it's it's a it's a touring band like mm -hmm. um yeah they tour a lot and they work on their stuff and mm -hmm. um obviously not not every band is like that but um but you can you can really if you like follow them and see okay what um what are they doing then you can see okay this guy is really working on it and yeah uh, and trying this to make it better also something why i practice so much to be prepared for life situations so that in life right. situations I don't have to be afraid of certain sections and that my yeah. head is free and I can focus more on the communication between certain guitar players, the perform uh, certain, certain bandmates, not only guitar players, uh, the performance, the audience, the feedback, yeah. all this kind of stuff. So I can focus a little bit more on this and stand up, in instead of standing there just and hoping that the next lick or the next riff <laughs> will work. Um, and this is yeah, this could why, be a why, nightmare. Yeah. It's like, I always imagine it. it's like preparing for a fight when you are a martial artist or something like this, when you're doing MMA or so, you have your fights coming up and this is something which my practice routine is for to get it done on the stage and to be ready for the stage, the big boss, which is called the stage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the big boss. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, and uh, there, this is something where I also truly believe that, or this is something that I always say here as well, 
uh, when you have a band or when you have two bands and they are playing the same thing with the same performance but one band is a tight up to 90 percent and the other band is maybe just tied together with their with their playing up to 60 percent subconsciously subconsciously the audience will more likely the band that is more tight more precise because it's easier for our ears to adapt when something is really nailed instead of or here's certain thing not working or here the the groove is not really tight all this kind of stuff Obviously. so yeah. I, I always try to, when I play with younger bands, to also teach them then to never underestimate these kind of things and how important it is to have a good technique and awareness and to be tight so that it's also easier to get liked and to get listened by the audience, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, also, for me, I always had, like, my first thing or my my priority was always the music itself the music mm -hmm. should be played as good as possible yeah. even though obviously you will like make mistakes every time you play that's normal uh you will fuck up parts that's okay and that's normal but um you can take it to a very minimum if you mm -hmm. know how and um, if you know yourself as a guitar player, because that's, uh, again, where you work on your weak weaknesses. Yeah. And, and at, yeah, at a certain point, the audience will even not really hear it anymore. I mean, there are certain mistakes that the audience maybe will hear, but often when I play live afterwards, I think like, oh, okay, I fucked it up here. I fucked it up there. Right. And there. But everyone in the audience will say, no, I could not hear it. And the same goes around when I'm visiting bands and I talk to bands later on. Like, for example, I was visiting uh, Persephone earlier this year and I was talking after that with Kalitos, their guitar player, and he was like, right. oh, that solo I fucked up and here I fucked up. I was like, no, I haven't heard anything of it. I enjoyed the whole show and for me it was absolutely fine, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course, especially when you have in ears or stuff, mm -hmm. you hear it so direct that uh, you hear every scratch yeah. and and obviously you feel bad after playing like <laughs> <laughs> after playing bad. <laughs> I, I think that is the hardest thing of life to get down from the stage and not think, oh, it was shit today. It is so easy to fall in this kind of hole in this kind of uh kind of yes yeah, space empty space and thinking after a show all the time like oh the, today was terrible and not good but in the end it was not that bad you know and it's yeah, not that yeah, easy yeah. to avoid that it's something it's, something that really is really kind of hard for me <laughs> it's always like that and actually that also keeps uh, like it keeps me practicing mm. uh, but um at the same time um my solution for that was at a certain point to know, okay, I'm going to be on stage in this situation. I'm going to be like, I try as best as I can. Mm -hmm. If I fuck it up. Yeah, that's it. So what um, people are going to like, maybe they upload it on YouTube and then some yeah. people, some guys are like hating uh, about it, but mm -hmm. it, I, I, I don't care anymore. Yeah. I don't care about these things anymore because um you are not perfect we're not machines everybody is like a human i played shows where i was sick i played shows where um i was in a bad mood because of some private stuff you never know what like musicians like um yeah we always have to deliver um yeah. and it doesn't matter like what's happening around yeah. and and but it it um it affects us it affects like uh, the performance and yeah. um and that's where uh my learning from this is like to um be aware of okay i um i give my best yeah the best i can um mm -hmm. i i want to be uh like to be able to play all the stuff i i prepared i go on stage do it and then after it mm. um after the show maybe it was not good yeah. but then 
it's um uh, it's good that you know what 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 where where the mistakes mm. but then but then and work on that but yeah. leave it don't be mad at yourself yeah. don't yeah. Uh, uh yeah don't be like rude to other people just because of that yeah doesn't help anybody um you just uh, hurt yourself with that um so yeah i just like just accepting the fact um that you're not perfect um already like helps yeah. a lot for me it is like in sports i mean even top players like i don't know cristiano ronaldo or what other kind of sports guys they're out there i'm not too much into this kind of sport thing um even those guys they don't perform every play every game at the same level and sometimes make mistakes and i think the most important thing as you already mentioned that is afterwards you analyze you see okay what where something where i could improve what right. maybe was a mistake that just happened sometimes these happen because i don't know you are stepping with your wrong foot on the wrong side or something like yeah. that or you yeah. something happens sometimes certain accidents you know but then on the other side there are certain sections where you know okay here i have to maybe check out the timing again here to check out the phrasing again all these kind of little details and this right. is more important to learn out of these shows yeah, exactly like you yeah, yeah. mentioned it. and yeah. the more you play the better and the, yeah, more, the more you, you analyze, play the more you know the and from yeah. what i've realized is the best shows are always at the end of a tour because the band is most tightened up together uh, yeah. it's most groovy at the end of it of a tour because there all the mistakes have been made and everybody knows this the so far what he has to play you know hopefully yeah <laughs> yeah most of the time it depends on 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 the band <laughs> and on the musicians but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah hopefully at the end of a tour the people will know how the riff works or something like that right, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. what kind of vocal lines they have to sing and all this kind of stuff yeah. yeah okay now in the end i want to talk with you about your next big upcoming project with which is your solo record uh maybe you can give or share some informations about that when it will be released and what kind of music it's going to be and all this kind of stuff yeah um thanks for the question it's uh i'm really excited about this project because it really combines stuff and like music i cannot um like i cannot share in my metal bands mm. because it's a lot more fusion funk influenced mm. and i have a lot of plans like uh with some people featuring on it and and even with singers and stuff like that oh even a thing is cool yeah yeah so um i i wanna like i wanna have some features on it as well um i released two singles so far the first one wishes and dreams um came out earlier in the summer this year and um a few like uh weeks or al already months ago um it's my second one mm -hmm. across the lines and a third one is coming with the rest uh of the ep um but as this project is totally self uh like i do everything on my own like obviously i don't play instruments on my own and i don't mix it on my own but all the like... features that you now <laughs> announced you will do on your own <laughs> right the vocals the saxophone all this yeah, yeah stuff. everything <laughs> um <laughs> no but i'm not with a label or anything or mm. with a with another company um, um so i can like so the schedule is really flexible and i work on the project whenever i have free time so that's why it's also not like really um like like it, it takes time mm. to do all this mm. but uh the p is ready uh, it's it's already done and it will come out within the next few weeks actually nice. but i will um i will share everything on my socials uh, of course and there will be a, another playthrough video for for a new song as well um mm -hmm. and it's yeah the music itself is like more like i i like to play around with um, different harmonies and grooves and that's basically how i combine it and 
um, also the improvisational element is obviously um, yeah is is really present as well because there is always there are always parts which are really like improvised and mm -hmm. that's what yeah. I like and um, yeah um, I think that describes it the best. Definitely worth to check out. You can check out your singles on every streaming platform so far. Yes. And on YouTube, Instagram. Uh, when I remember correctly, the first one was really, really kind of Satriani esque from the from the vibe, a little bit kind of darker feeling. And the second one was really fusion, funky, uh, really, true. really worth to check out. And yeah, thank you, Raphael, for having you here on this YouTube channel and share your wisdom of practicing this beautiful instrument <laughs> with us. For Thanks. the viewers out there, definitely worth to check out uh, Raphael's YouTube, Raphael's Instagram channel, all the music that he's done so far, uh, especially with his current band, Obsidious. The latest record, one of my favorite records from 2022, correct? Or 21? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, the first singles came out in 2021, but the, the... it took a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it took a long while. But it's such a, such an amazing record, and definitely worth to check it out. Everything. So, uh, yeah, I wish all of you guys a lot of fun practicing. Thank you again, Raphael, and by that. Thanks for having me. Cheers and stay progress. Bye. See you next time.